All right, I want to talk today about the ichthys symbol or the Jesus fish, depending on who you talk to. They say it's a Christian symbol. Well, we're going to look at that today. Um, I have here a Wikipedia article, and, I, and again, you know, I'm, I use Wikipedia because it's basically saying what most people believe. Wikipedia is not a perfect, definitive resource that tells you everything that you need to know or anything. I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying that this is what most people believe. So I'm reading here. It says, Ichthys, from the Koine Greek word for fish, is a symbol consisting of two intersecting arcs, the ends of the right side extending beyond the meeting point, so as to resemble the profile of a fish, used by early Christians as a secret Christian symbol, and now known colloquially as the sign of the fish or the Jesus fish. Okay, and of course you can, most people can, I think, have seen this symbol. It looks like a, a goldfish kind of thing, you know. It's two arcs that intersect, and then at the end, they come to the point at the one end, and at the other end, they cross over each other to kind of form the tail. History. It says here, uh, ICTHYS is an acronym for, and has a bunch of words there, which translates into English as Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Okay, the iota is the first letter of Greek for Jesus. The chi is the first letter of Christos, Greek for anointed. Theta is the first letter of Theo, Greek for gods. Uh, the genitive case of Theos, Greek for God. And uh, ips, Ypsilon, I guess is how you say that, is the first letter of the Greek word for son. And Sigma is the first letter of Greek for savior. So the I-C-T-Y-S is what you have there, T-H, I, well, actually I-C-H-T-H-Y-S. That's how you get the ichthys thing. This explanation is given, among others, by Augustine, look out for that, in his Civite Dei, with, where he notes that the generating sentence, and they give the Greek thing there, has 27 letters, which is 3 times 3 times 3, which in that age indicated power. Augustine quotes also an ancient text from the Sibylian oracles whose verses are an acrostic of the generating sentence. Historians say the 20th century use of the ichthys motif is an adaption based on an early Christian symbol which included a small cross for the eye or the Greek letters, and they give it again there. An ancient adaption of ichthys is a wheel which contains the letters, the thing there, superimposed, such that the results result resembles an eight-spoked wheel. Now they have the symbol there pictured, um, and it shows this eight-spoked wheel. Now if you look at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, it's a large, if you look at it from up above, the, the courtyard in front of the basilica is a large eight-spoked wheel. And right in the middle is an Egyptian obelisk. I like to ask Catholics about that sometime. You know, they, I say your, your cult is a pagan cult. It is not. It's the one true church. Okay, why did the Pope ship an obelisk from Egypt and put it in the center of an eight-spoked wheel? Couldn't they make an obelisk there in Rome? What's it about? It's an ancient, and excuse me here, but it's an ancient sex symbol. The eight-spoked wheel is a symbol of the female the obelisk in the middle is a symbol of the male. It's symbolizing intercourse. Now, I'm not going to get into it any further than that, but uh, Roman Catholicism is the ancient Baal worship system. It's the ancient system of Babylonian Baal worship, which is based around sex perversion. And you say, well, I don't know if the Catholic Church is ever connected to sex perversion. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, look at the newspapers, look at the news. All the time, these priests are getting caught because they're perverts, they're molesting children. You know, they're fornicating, they're sodomizing, they're, they're just wicked. And you read back in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and it talks about Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. Yeah, and it says that she has committed spiritual fornication with the kings of the earth. Okay, it says fornication, but you read the the context, it's spiritual, speaking spiritually. Okay, the, the Roman Catholic system is a very, very wicked system, and Augustine was a Catholic. Okay, he was not a good Christian man. He was a pagan. 
the ancient Romans took their pagan beliefs, which were the same old Babylonian beliefs, and they took words out of the Bible and they, they kind of changed their pagan instead of Diana, like of the Ephesians you read about in the Bible, instead of Diana, you have now, it's no longer Artemis or Diana or Shingmu or some of these other names or Semiramis, if you go back far enough. Now it's Mary. You know. I mean, that's what they did. I'm not going to go into the whole thing there. We're going to read here in just a little bit from the, the book, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. But let me continue with this Wikipedia article here. It says down a little bit further, it says the early church. Look out for that. What you need to understand about church history is that there are two churches and two Bibles. People want you to believe, the, the church historians want you to believe that there was one church and one Bible down through the centuries. That is an absolute lie. There are two churches and two Bibles. Okay, The true Bible-believing Christians were never part of the Roman Catholic Church. The true Bible-believing Christians never used the Alexandrian-type Bibles. The true Bible believers used the Bible that goes back to Antioch, the Syrian text type. Known today, the best manifestation of it today is the King James Bible. Okay, The other church, the pagan church, the Roman Catholics, they use the Alexandrian Bible. And you say, what's the best representation of that? We'll take your pick. NIV, NASV, you know, NRSV, RSV, you know, all of them. They're all garbage. They're not the same Bible. And we are not the same church as the Roman Catholic Church. And when you hear, you read a history type of thing and they talk about the early church, most of the time they're referring to Roman Catholicism. Okay, look out for that. But it says here, and you got to watch out for this one too. This is a good one. According to tradition. Ooh. Hey, you know what you need to do as a Christian? If it's not in your King James Bible, you better be very careful what you believe, what you read. Watch out for this tradition thing. What was it that Jesus always was rebuking the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes? Why was he always rebuking them? Because of their traditions. They held their traditions above the Word of God. Look out for that. But anyhow, let's continue. According to tradition... Ancient Christians during their persecution by the Roman Empire in the first few centuries after Christ used the fish symbol to mark meeting places and tombs or to distinguish friends from foes. When a Christian met a stranger in the road, the Christian sometimes drew one arc of the simple fish outlined in the dirt. If the stranger uh, drew the other arc, both believers knew that they were in good company. Uh, current bumper sticker and business card uh, uses of uses of the fish harken back to this practice. The symbol is still used today to show that the bearer is a practicing Christian. That's written by Alicia Kaufman in Christianity Today. Christianity Today is one of the most wicked, vile publications out there. They are totally ecumenical. It's Billy Graham's whole thing. I mean, look out for Christianity Today. There are articles in there that promote New Age philosophy. I mean, Christianity is not something I would, you know, pay much attention to. Then it says, There are several other hypotheses as to why the fish was chosen. Some sources indicate that the earliest literary references came from the recommendation of Clement of Alexandria to his readers to engrave their seals with the dove or fish. However, it can be inferred from Roman monumental sources such as the Capella Grecia and the sacrament chapels of the Catacomb of St. Callistus that the fish symbol was known to Christians much earlier. Then they go on to quote the ESV, different verses from the ESV. And we're going to look at that. They're trying to say, well, there are references that Jesus made to go out and be fishers of men and things, you know. So that's why we have the fish symbol. No, that doesn't work. We're going to look at that today in the study. But the, the fact is there, two of their sources that they quote are the Roman monumental sources, probably the Roman Catholic Church, and also Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria was the first head of the school in Alexandria that produced the new version manuscripts. The next one after him was uh, Origen. Origen 
of Alexandria. He was the next head of the, the school there in Alexandria, Egypt. And that's, that's who's running the thing here. That's where your new versions come from. These pagan new versions that remove references to the deity of Jesus Christ and other very important doctrinal uh, verses. I mean, it's just really, really bad. But I'm not going to read all the thing there. But it talks about Tertullian then in his treatise on baptism. You know, again, they'll go to these church fathers. These guys were heretics big time. They denied most of the main fundamentals of the faith. But it says here, what about pre-Christian origins? Hmm. Fish may have been used as symbols before Christianity, possibly representing several goddesses. It has been associated with Aphrodite, at Targetus, Dagon, Ephesus, Isis, Delphine, and Pelagia. Barbara Walker, in her book, The Women's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects, suggests that Ichthys was the son of the sea goddess Atargetus, Atargetus, I guess, and that his symbol was a representation of sexuality and fertility. The fish has also been used to symbolize Pisces, the zodiac sign. The sun was in Pisces, the fish. On the vernal equinox shortly before the founding of Christianity, and depending on the line of demarcation, may remain so for approximately 600 more years. Though this is a topic of debate, see astrological age. Um, then it goes on to say a bunch of other things here. Uh, well, I'll just read this. It says, popular culture. The Jesus fish has become an icon of modern Christianity. Today it can be seen as a decal or emblem on the rear of automobiles or as pendants or necklaces as a sign that the owner is a Christian. It is incorporated into business logos or in business advertisements and listed listings in telephone books. It is also seen on clothing. Versions of this include an ichthys with Jesus or the Greek word there in the center or simply the ichthys outlined by itself. It can also be seen in Grant Morrison's The Invisibles where a character explains that it represents the center interlocking part of a Venn diagram Symbolic of reality itself, which is supposedly formed by the intersection of two higher warring planes of existence. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then finally it says here in the video for singer-songwriter Beck's Loser, one man wears a t-shirt including or featuring the ichthys with the word loser. So, you know, it's, it's hardly a thing that Christians alone are just using. And the guys even, you know, people in the lost world are even mocking it. But it's very interesting there, it said earlier, the fish has also been used to symbolize Pisces. I was looking up pictures of the um, fish symbol, and I'm going to include a picture here with this sermon. You can see it there on the, on the screen. And that is, it says, one of the things that they sell, they say it's Ichthys Pisces. And a lot of these places that sell this Ichthys symbol, they'll call it Ichthys Pisces. Okay, it's part of the astrological thing. It's not a Christian symbol. But it said there in this article that uh, it could represent, it also could, is known to represent Dagon. Now what's this? Well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We're not going to read one other thing here. Then we'll get into the thing of Dagon in the Bible. Um, real quick here, Alexander Hislop, page 114. I'm going to read this. This is kind of an interesting thing here. And this this is a book that will make your head spin. I mean, this is, there's a lot in this book. Um, it was written, I think, back in the 1800s, and uh, people were a lot more intelligent back then than they are today. But it says here, Barosis, uh, Bunsen's Egypt, Volume 1, page 707. To identify Nimrod with Oannes, Mentioned by Barosus as appearing out of the sea, it will be remembered that Nimrod has been proved to be Bacchus. Then for proof that Nimrod or Bacchus, on being overcome by his enemies, was fabled to have taken refuge in the sea, see chapter 4, section 1, when therefore he was represented as reappearing, it was natural that he should re reappear in the very character of Oannes as a fish god. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. Babylon, the ancient Babylonian religion, took many of the Old Testament prophecies that there would one day be God manifest in the flesh and that he would die and rise again. And the ancient pagans took that and they used it to symbolize their own gods. So you'll have these people say, 
you know, our witchcraft beliefs go back before Christianity. And a lot of Christians go, oh, that's not true. That can't be true. Oh, actually, yes, it is. There's a lot of occult beliefs out there that predate Christianity. They don't predate the Bible. They don't predate the Old Testament, but they're there before the, the first century A.D. Why? Well, because the pagans could see the scriptures. They could understand that there would one day, that God would come and die for man's sin and be raised again the third day. They could see the Old Testament prophecies. So they faked it on their own. And they'd say that, oh, Nimrod, you know, he died and three days later he rose again as Tammuz. That's what they taught. And then they would change it and they'd say, well, well, we don't believe in Nimrod, but we believe in Bacchus. They'd come up with all these other terms or, or you know, Isis, Osiris, you know, Horus, all this. That was the Egyptian terms for the, the three there. On and on. But let me continue here. Um, now Jerome calls Dagon, the well-known fish god, Piscium Maoris, the fish of sorrow which goes far to identify that fish god with Bacchus, the lamented one, and the identification is complete when Hesius tells us that some called Bacchus Ichthys, or the fish. Hmm. So another ancient Greek philosopher actually said that Bacchus is Ichthys. So was the, word, was the term Ichthys around before Jesus Christ? Yes. And I can't, I can't say for sure, because I can't go back in time and whatever, that there might have been people that were trying to use this fish symbol and stuff and, and all that. But hey, we're not supposed to be using symbols. And I'm going to get into that as we continue in this study. According to Scripture, you shouldn't be making symbols of anybody in the Godhead, any member of it, including Jesus Christ. All right, and I'm going to get into that in just a little bit. But the point is, this ichthys... This fish was around before Jesus Christ showed up. So people say, oh, it's the Jesus fish. No, it was not. Let me continue here. I'm going to jump back to page 215. It says here, as the Pope bears the keys of Jan or the key of Janus, so he wears the mitre of Dagon. The excavations of Nineveh have put this beyond all possibility of doubt. The papal mitre is just entirely different from the mitre of Aaron and the Jewish high priests. That mitre was a turban. The two-horned mitre, which the Pope wears when he sits on the high altar at Rome and receives the adoration of the cardinals, is the very mitre worn by Dagon, the fish god of the Philistines and Babylonians. Okay, and he has some ancient, you know, pictures here of, uh, well, drawings actually, of hieroglyphics that have been found where they show the ancient priests and they have this fish type garment on and they have the hat which on when you look at him from the side it's got two horns it looks like a fish's mouth open that's what the ancient babylonian priests of dagon would wear now look at a picture of the pope when he has this tall hat on his head and he turns to the side and it looks like a fish's mouth in fact it's even red on the inside White on the outside, red on the inside, just like a mouth would be. Why? Because they're practicing ancient Babylonian witchcraft. That's what Roman Catholicism is. It's not Christianity. It's not, oh, it's the original church and we came out of it. No, no, no. We did not come out of it. Okay, A Bible-believing Christian is not a Protestant. A Protestant reformer is somebody who said, I don't want to get rid of Catholicism or deny Catholicism. I just want to protest the abuses and reform it. Okay, that's not what you should be as a Christian. As a Christian, you should say, come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins. Get out of that wicked Roman Catholic system. Don't have anything to do with it. All right, so there we have some historical stuff there. I wanted to just read that as a basis. Now we're going to actually go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about this thing of the fish. Judges chapter 16. Go back to, into your Old Testament there. We're going to go to Judges chapter 16. Judges 16 verse 20. There's a lot of very, very interesting things 
back in your Old Testament. I've heard some people say, well, the Old Testament's not for us, so I'm not even going to bother reading it. Uh, that's a big mistake. There's an awful lot back there that you need to know. But let's look here. Judges chapter 16, verse 20. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Now what's going on here? Well, here's the story of Samson and Delilah. Okay, his he's messing around with a with a heathen prostitute, basically. And she keeps trying to trick him into telling him the telling her the secret of his power. And she finally gets through to him. You know? Watch out for a whorish woman, by the way. The Bible has a lot to say about that. A harlot. You know there's a church that's called the Mother of Harlots? See, the Bible ties in a lot of times. But anyhow, we won't get into that right now. But you see here, he finally told her the secret of his strength and she had his hair cut. And he didn't even realize. He woke out of his sleep and he didn't realize that the Lord had departed from him. Okay? But let's continue here. Verse 21. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god. And to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Who was the God that the Philistines worshipped? Dagon. I'm sure that there were other ones probably too, but their main God was Dagon. Now let's look at another story here. And of course, if you want to read the rest of the story there, Samson pulls the pillars of the house down on top of them and kills them all, including himself. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to see another little story here about the fish god Dagon. You say, oh no, I didn't realize that there was another god out there. Well, notice it's a lowercase g. It's not a capital G like our god. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10. We're going to see about the power of Dagon here. I'm going to give you a little bit of background here before we uh, get into the thing of Dagon. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a great, very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli... Hophni and Phinehas were slain. Now, if you want to listen to more on that whole issue, you can listen to the sermon on elderly, God's gift of elderly Christians. Okay, that's another one that I preached where I got into this whole thing, how these two sons were not proper sons. They were not respecting their father, Eli. And as a result, God actually put a curse on that family and said, you'll never again have an old man in your house. See, it's an honor to have elderly Christians. And any church that would go against elderly Christians and push the elderly Christians out is not a church that God honors. And there are a lot of these modern churches that come in, they bring the rock music in, and they push the elderly people out. They're wicked churches, and you do well to leave them. If you don't have elderly Christians in your assembly where you meet in your congregation, you need to leave. <laughs> okay? But, uh, Jump down here to verse 12. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And he, when he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli, now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there, what is there done, my son? 
And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Speaking of Eli there. Eli actually died because of the shock of hearing that the ark of God was taken. I mean, it's bad enough that he heard that his sons died, that his sons were killed, but then when he heard that the ark of God was taken, that was it. Fell over and died. Verse 19, And his daughter-in-law Phinehas' wife was with child near to be delivered, and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her. Did you know that trauma can actually put a woman into childbirth, into labor? Oh, the Bible's not scientific. Yes, it is. Right there, it gives you an example. Continuing here, verse 20. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that uh, you could write this on a lot most of the church buildings here in America. Just go there and name them Ichabod. They say, oh, it's, it's a LCBC, Lancaster, Lancaster County Bible Church. No, it's Ichabod. The glory of God is departed. These modern churches are functioning without God. They're not doing things according to the Word of God. They could care less what the Word of God says. You go there and you start saying, you know, the Bible says, and they'll say, get out of here, Bible thumper. You know, that's what they're doing. Why? Well, the glory of God departed. Like I said, 90% of the churches in this country aren't even doing things according to Scripture, according to the written Word of God. Why? Because they want to worship the flesh. That's what it's about. They're flesh centers. They're carnivals. But we'll continue here. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Look what happens here. 1 Samuel chapter 5 verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. See, they had their, their God was an idol. A real live idol. And he was there in the house and you could come in and worship him. You say, oh, what a, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, what a bunch of demented pagans. I'm sure glad that people don't do that anymore today. Really? Did you ever see a Roman Catholic church? They got statues all through them. And you say, wow, that, but people wouldn't pray to them. Oh, yeah, they would. The 14 stations of the cross, you go around to the different saints and you go down there and you kneel before the saint and you do your, you cross yourself and all this stuff and you rub your little rosary beads and all this stuff. Yeah, same pagan beliefs going on. Go past the Catholic churches, they got statues of the saints, statues of their Christ, statues of angels, statues of all kinds of things. Yeah, and there's, you know, even some of the Protestant denominations, they'll have things like, you know, journey to the cross or whatever the, the Lutherans, you know, they do the same things. Joyce Meyer, the famous cell evangelist that's on TV, you know, I won't call her the other name. We call her Butch Meyer. Okay, I'll just say. Joyce Meyer, she actually paid, I forget what it was. It was ridiculous. Tens of thousands of dollars for like this, I forget if they were porcelain or if it was some tapestry or whatever, but it was the Stations of the Cross for her offices. Why would a supposed Protestant buy Stations of the Cross? Because she's a pagan. Okay? Deal with it. But anyhow, they brought, this, they brought the Ark of God, and now they put it into the, the house of their god, Dagon. we got a competition going here now. Two gods in one place. Who's going to win? Look at verse 3. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. <laughs> and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. 
Isn't that funny? God says, everything bows down to me. You read back in Philippians, I think it is, where it talks about principalities and powers and rulers and everything. It's all subservient to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. It's amazing. Everything bows before God, including a false devil there like Dagon. And the Lord says, he goes in there, just the ark of God's in there, and he goes, Dagon, fall before the ark. Blam, down it goes. <laughs> you know, don't worry about this thing of, oh, there are other gods. Yeah, and they're subservient to the Lord. But continuing here. <clears throat> they set him up again. Verse 4, And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. <laughs> Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coasts thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Now I'm going to just have to tell you what emeralds are here. They're very similar to our modern English word. Emeralds are hemorrhoids. That's what they are. See, that's kind of gross. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. Okay, that's what the, that's what the Lord did to him. You know, that was his judgment on him. Verse 10. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron, and it came to pass as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. <laughs> so they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it, so, and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Don't mess with the ark of God. Okay? Now, uh, did Dagon deliver them? Earlier there, back in uh, Judges, they were, they were bragging about, our God Dagon brought us Sam uh, Samson, you know? Which was foolish, because that, that wasn't it at all. It's Samson's sin, so God said, okay, go ahead. You do it your way. Dagon had nothing to do with it. And here Dagon, their little god, their little false god, couldn't do a thing to protect them. Okay? Now, does God respect or tolerate other gods? Well, we just saw it right there. No, he doesn't. But I'm going to show you a couple of very interesting verses here. Turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. You know, there's a this whole movement now, this ecumenical movement, this, you know, well, I don't want to judge. I don't want to speak harshly against anybody else. You know, if, if somebody wants to believe in Allah, then okay. Allah's a moon god, by the way. Just one of the, the pagan gods uh, that the people, the pagan people worship. He's not God, uh, the God of the Bible. He's just a pagan moon god. And it, it's incredible to me how fast Islam is growing. I just can't understand how people could be so dumb. But the Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says here, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Don't praise graven images. Okay, we're going to look at the thing of graven images as we continue in this study. But God is not for the graven image. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 8. Turn over there says here fear ye not neither be afraid have not i told thee from that time and have declared it ye are even my witnesses is there a god is there a god beside me yea there is no god i know not any 
So the Lord's saying, hey, don't fear other people out there. Don't fear these. You know, I, I have absolutely no fear of being struck down by Allah, <laughs> you know, or any other false god, uh, uh, Vishnu or, or, you know, Mary of the Roman Catholics. Mary of the Roman Catholics is not the Mary of the Bible. She's the queen of heaven, which the ancient pagans worshipped. You can read about that in the book of Jeremiah. I don't have any fear about being knocked down by them. You know? I mean, go ahead, Allah. Try or do your worst. I'm not worried about it. Why? Because I'm saved. I'm born again. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He's my God. He's the true God. All right? It's ridiculous. God doesn't know of any other gods out there. He doesn't say, oh, well, there, there is that other guy. Yeah, he's kind of gaining on me as far as strength is concerned. No, there's no other God. Only the God of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 through 6. Let's read that quick. It says here, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. It doesn't matter if any people say, well, I don't know God, so I don't believe in him. Well, that's your problem. Okay, I feel bad for you if you're an atheist. Verse 6, That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There's only one God in this universe. All the others are false. Just little devils that people worship. You say, what's this have to do with the fish? The fish god. Well, I just showed you there, Dagon is the ancient fish god. The priests of Dagon wore fish-type outfits. They wore the mitre on their head just like the Pope wears today. And a lot of the other little cardinals and bishops and whatever else. Little titles that they come up with. You know, but... Uh, what about this thing? People say, well, yes, but you know, I still think that the early Christians used the symbol of a fish because it's somewhat symbolic of Jesus and stuff. Does the Bible ever teach that Jesus is symbolized as a fish? Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to hit a couple places here where the Bible does talk about fish. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Because there are references to fish in the New Testament. And they are symbolic many times. Sometimes they're literal, sometimes they're symbolic. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did Jesus preach repentance? You better believe it. And if you have a preacher that's not preaching repentance, you have a false prophet. Plain and simple. A lot of the brethren are getting away from repentance because they want to fill their church buildings with numbers. And you tell sinners that they need to repent, that's not very popular. So you just tell them believe and receive, and then that sounds much better. You know, yeah. Verse 18. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Interesting. Verse 20, And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. You know, it's interesting because I've done quite a bit of fishing in my life. I love to go fishing. And one of the worst times to leave is when the fish are biting. When you're really catching a lot of fish and you're really doing good, somebody says, oh, it's time to go. we got to get going. It's like, oh, man, you know, couldn't we stay just a little bit longer? You know, and it, it's interesting there. You know, it doesn't say necessarily that they were catching a lot of fish, but maybe they were. I don't know. Maybe they were having a bad day. I'm not sure. But the fact is Jesus comes and he says, hey, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they don't say, well, let me just reel in my, my lure here and put my tackle box away, you know. They didn't have that, of course, but, you know, they would say, well, let me just bring my nets in here and just kind of fold them. Let me make sure that things are, they dropped it, dropped it and said, okay, I'll follow you, Lord. Hmm. It's kind of rough, isn't it? That's what we should be like with the Lord. The Lord says, I want you to do this or that. Okay, drop what you have and go do it. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. But uh, in there in Matthew 4, did you see anything about Jesus being a fish? No. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. That doesn't mean that men are fish. 
right? And it certainly doesn't mean that Jesus was a fish. But look at Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start here at verse 7. It says here, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, uh, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Okay, is Jesus symbolized by the fish? No. It's talking about something to eat. There's what it's talking about. Okay? Jesus is not symbolized as a fish. Again. And I'm going to really show you a good verse later on to prove that whole thing. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. See another example here of a fish. A fish that's mentioned. And, and you know, again, the, the, one of the reasons I'm... I mean, most people that are going to listen to this are kind of like, well, yeah, obviously... You know, this is obvious that, that Jesus isn't symbolized as a fish, you know, in the Gospels. But the fact is that this stupid Wikipedia article was referring to this and saying that that justifies the using this ichthys thing. And it doesn't. That's why I'm showing you these verses. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. It says here, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, now there you have it symbolically given that fish are types of men. But does it say that Jesus Christ is a fish? No. Again, you, you're not going to be able to prove this thing from Scripture. Jesus Christ is not a fish. Matthew chapter 14. Go over there. Look at verse 15. It says here, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy them victuals. Victuals is another word for food. Uh, verse 16. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave loaves to his disciples, and his disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up of, of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, beside women and children." Again, here you have a literal uh, feeding of the 5,000. There's no symbology there. Matthew chapter 15. Jump over there. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. So we're going to go next. It says here, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they now, or they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to uh, fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men, beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude, and took ship, and came into the coast of Magdala. He's saying, now wait a second, I thought it was five thousand that were fed. Here it says four thousand. Oh, we have a contradiction. That's what a lost person would think. Well, let's continue here. Matthew chapter 16, verse 6 says here, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. <laughs> it's not what Jesus was talking about. And we're going to see that as we continue. Verse 8, 
which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Why are they worried about not having bread? Don't they remember the, the fact that Jesus fed the multitudes? Now look at verse 9. Do ye not yet remember, or do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Uh, how is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So there's no contradiction in the Bible. Now see, if you're a lost person looking for contradictions, you'll pick up on something like that, and you'll say, oh, see, two different accounts, and they, one says 5,000, the other says 4,000. Well, they were two different accounts, but they were two different events. There's no contradiction. There are no contradictions in the King James Bible, by the way. Okay? Right there you see how the Jesus Christ fed two different times the people with bread and fish. Does that mean that, that uh, Jesus Christ is symbolized as a fish? No. Does that mean that Christians should go around symbolizing themselves as fish? No. doesn't say that. Okay, one more place to look up here in, in Matthew. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. I like this story. This is one of my favorite ones. Matthew 17, verse 24 says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus uh, prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish uh, that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. I've been fishing for a long time, but I've never caught a fish with a coin in its mouth. <laughs> kind of nice. You know, if you could go fishing and catch some fish with a gold or silver coin or something in their mouth, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd be doing fishing all the time. It'd be my full-time job. <laughs> you know, out there, man, a one-ounce gold coin, this is great. You know, well, what's the, the point there, though? The point is that, that God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, as God could say to the fish, hey, that coin that fell overboard from that boat three months ago, go down there and eat it, get it in your mouth, and now there's going to be a hook coming down with some bait on it. This guy named Peter is going to cast it to you. I want you to bite onto that hook. He's going to reel you in. Don't worry, he'll put you back. You know, he just wants the money out of your mouth. You see, the Lord Jesus could do that. He didn't say, well, hopefully you go down there and there might be a fish that has a coin in its mouth. He said, go down there. There's going to be a fish. The first one you catch, he even described which one it was going to be. The first one. It's going to have a coin in your mouth. That's enough to pay the tax. Amazing. How could he do that if he was just a just a holy man or something like that? He couldn't. You know, fish don't make it a habit to scoop up coins in their mouths. Okay? But they do when God in the flesh tells them to. And that's what was going on there. But again, can you use that scripture to justify making a, a fish symbol for Jesus? No. It's not there. Another thing here in the Gospels I want to look at quickly, uh, John chapter 21. John 21, verse 1. John 21, verse 1. Okay, it says here, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Remember the sons of Zebedee from earlier? They were mending the, the nets with their father, and, 
And they left it all and followed Jesus. Verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. I actually heard a, a Baptist preacher the one time use that verse to say that they weren't doing the work of the Lord, that they left the work of the Lord and forsook it so they'd go fishing. And it's like, that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. They were earning a living, okay? <laughs> and not only that, but they didn't exactly have uh, frozen fish sticks in their freezers at home, you know, or, or food with preservatives in it. You see, back in the first century, you had to catch the food that you were to eat that day. Yes, they had ways to preserve food, but they didn't have three months of food stored up in their cabinets in their home. Okay, Fishing was a normal part of life, just as hunting or, or whatever would be, or going out and getting fruits and vegetables. That's what you did. That's how you lived. So, you know, if you ever hear somebody trying to use this, that they forsook the Lord, and you know, Peter left and he took the others with him. Oh, come on. Just ridiculous, some of the stuff people come up with. But anyhow, continuing, verse 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish lay thereon, and bread." Interesting that Jesus chooses the same meal that he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 with to feed his disciples. Pretty interesting. Verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three, and for all that were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Okay? I wonder what the fish tasted like that Jesus cooked. I think that's kind of interesting. Someday at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Lord's going to serve us. He's going to cook for us. I wonder what God, the creator of the universe, wonder what his cooking tastes like. <laughs> Pretty incredible. But what did Peter do? Jesus says to him, uh, uh, verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Verse 11, Simon, P Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. Hey, you know what? What did Jesus Christ tell him originally? Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. How many people did Peter preach to and lead to the Lord in Acts chapter 2? 3,000. And there were times when it was other thousands. You know, sometime, someday when Peter comes there before the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to have quite a net full of fishes. And that's something that we should all be there wanting to do. Now, we can't all say, you know, I've led 5,000 to the Lord. Peter led 5,000, so I ought, you, you have to, as a Christian, leave five, at least 5,000. The Lord doesn't expect that. Okay, the Lord just wants to see quality rather than quantity. Okay, <clears throat> but the fact is you should have some fish that you catch to take to glory with you for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to eat our converts. <laughs> but the point is, this is symbolically speaking of people being the fish, and that they're caught, and they go to the marriage supper. Okay, it's a pretty interesting thing there. But um, <clears throat> again, is Jesus Christ symbolized by the fish? No. Where's this whole thing, thing coming from? Well, we're going to hit just a couple more places here, and then we're done. What about the Ten Commandments? Exodus chapter 20. 
Go back to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to look at the second commandment. First commandment is there in uh, verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, don't have Dagon as your god. And by the way, you say, well, I'm a Catholic, but I, I you know, only worship God. Wrong. You worship the Pope. Because the Pope is the vicarious Philly D. That's one of the titles of him. Which means faithful substitute God. He calls himself the Holy Father. That's God's title. And by the way, the Bible says back in the book of Psalms, it says, holy and reverend are his name, meaning God. Watch out for anybody calling themselves the reverend. That's God's title. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Be very careful of that. But look here, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Well, I have a Jesus fish here. Really? You say, well, it's Jesus or it's Ichthys Pisces. Pisces is an astrological thing. Well, then that would be in the heaven above, wouldn't it? Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You say, well, okay, all right, yeah, sure. But it, it didn't specifically say fish. So maybe we can get by, right? Well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, starting at verse 14. Deuteronomy 4, 14. Okay, it says here, And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that ye might do them in the land, whither ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. You know the book of Romans chapter 1, and we go over that time and time again because it's so, tr it's so true, so profound. It talks about that they worship the creature and the creation more than the creator. Yeah, and that's exactly what people do. They'll worship Allah, a moon god. They'll worship a created man like the Pope with his Dagon fish hat on. And they'll worship a symbol, like a fish. Well, that symbolizes Jesus. No, it doesn't. It's a sin to have a graven image of the Godhead. You're not supposed to do it. And the fact of the matter is, I proved in this study, from secular and Christian sources, that the fish was a symbol of Bacchus. If you go back the whole way to Babylon, Nimrod, Bacchus, and then it comes up as Dagon. Another name for Nimrod. You know, just like Mary had many names, you know, Semiramis had many names, which the modern one is Mary. You're worshiping a false god. Ichthys Pisces is a false god. And you say, but the early Christians, they, they, they use the term Ichthys there to, to refer to Jesus. Well, if they did, then it was a mistake. And we shouldn't repeat their mistake. If the early Christians used it as a symbol to, to recognize each other, they were using it as a mistake. And we shouldn't be mimicking that. You should not have that symbol. You say, well, you can't prove this stuff because this is all Old Testament. And we're not under the Old Testament. We're not under the law. All right. Acts chapter 17. Acts 
Acts chapter 17, we're going to look at verse 29. See, there's a great danger when you start saying that we have to have a symbol. We have to have some way to represent the Godhead. We have to be able to show people what the Godhead looks like. That's, there's a great danger in that because oftentimes the symbol that you choose is actually a pagan symbol. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute too here. But Acts chapter 17, verse 29, you say the Old Testament commands there about graven images. Are they for us today? Well, let's see about that. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Huh. We ought not to think that the Godhead is a like a graven image? I guess that command still holds true for today. Yes, it absolutely does. Verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Which, again, there are so many verses in Scripture that just boot Catholic, or, uh, Calvinism out of the, the water. <laughs> okay, and right there's another one. Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. How can you repent if you're not one of the elect? doesn't work. Okay, if you have non-elect that cannot get elect if they wanted to because God's not chosen them and all this stupid stuff that Calvinism teaches, you got a real problem there. But look at verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. Talking about Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look at one more verse of scripture here, another passage. You say, well, then how are we supposed to live? Okay, you took away our symbol. How are we supposed to live? Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You say, well, if we can't symbolize things, you know, if things get rough here and we have to try to, Christianity has to go underground and that's going to happen eventually here because of the sodomite agenda mainly. And it's just amazing to me. Islam is respected and revered, but Christianity is now cut down and everything. You know, you want to talk about terrorism. The Islamic faith is a terroristic faith. You know, I realize that there's a lot of, of other systems out there that are terrorism, but Islam teaches terrorism. It's just as simple as that. So how are we supposed to live as Christians if things get very, very rough? You say, well, we should come up with secret symbols. No, you shouldn't. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hmm. You know, the Bible teaches that the just shall live by faith. Verse 6 there in Hebrews chapter 11 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We are to live by faith, not by things that are seen. And you say, well then, we're to be just blind. It doesn't say that. It says there, uh, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, according to over there in the book of Romans. You're not left without any kind of a guide down here. You are to have the word of God. Hey, you say, well, well what happens if we have an a underground church? The churches have to go underground. How can we tell if somebody's a true Christian? Simple. Is the word of God in them? If you meet somebody and they say, I'm a Christian, you know, and everything, you say, oh, what, what do you believe? What are your beliefs? Well, you see, I, I believe that um, there's only one true church. And I believe that the, the head of that church is to be an infallible guide and that he is to interpret Scripture for the laity. You go, oh, wait a second here. You're dealing with a Catholic. But if you meet somebody and they say, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, He is God, God manifest in the flesh. You know, I believe that, that the Bible says the just shall live by faith and they start to quote King James scriptures. Well, you're dealing with, uh, there's a good chance that you're dealing with a Christian. You still need to be careful. But the fact is, 
our little secret, you know, if we have to do things secretly and, and talk to people in secret ways, it should be based on Scripture, knowledge of Scripture, not on some pagan symbol, you know. A couple of good examples of pagan symbols that have been taken by both Christian and Jew. You have the hexagram. Say, well, that's the Star of David. Show me the words Star of David in the Bible. I'll show you where it says that they have taken up the star of their god Remphan and Moloch. You're not supposed to make stars and symbols of the Godhead. How about the ichthys symbol? Well, I showed you today in this study that the ichthys symbol is not based on Christianity. It's based on ancient Babylonian paganism. How about the trichetra, the three-pointed star? People say, well, that's a representation of the Godhead. The New King James Version puts it right on the front cover. And all these different people that call themselves Christians, they use the three-pointed star. It's a symbol in witchcraft. It's not a symbol that we're supposed to use. They say, well, we can use it secretly to, to, to communicate with one another. Okay, what happens if you go and you use the three-pointed star to tell if somebody's a real Christian and they're actually a witch? And they say, oh yeah, I know that symbol. See, it's a dangerous thing. You go to the witch and you say, what saith the scriptures? See, a lost person, you know, you go back into the Gospels there, John, I forget what chapter it is, but Jesus says, I'm going to manifest myself to you and not to the world. And they say, how is that going to happen? And he says, I'm going to do it through the word. You're going to understand the words, but the lost world isn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about the lost world cannot understand the word of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. This book right here is our secret communication, if it has to come to that. The written word, not symbols, not pictures, not images, not statues. Avoid that stuff. It's the written word of God that we're supposed to be using. So should you use the ichthys symbol? No. And I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't really think much of it before and stuff like that. And I have two ties that I've used over the years, two neckties, and they have the ichthys symbol on them. Am I ever going to wear them again? Not after doing this study. Nope. Sorry. Why? Because there's no basis for it in Scripture. You know, is God going to, you know, condemn me to hell because I wore them? No. If you have some of that stuff around your house, some little fish thing around your house, that symbol around your house, get rid of it. You know, you were deceived. I was deceived. You know, brethren, you're going to be deceived about many things in this life. Satan has laid many traps. Okay? He's going to get you in one of them. But the key is, when you get caught in a trap, to get yourself out of it. Don't just stay in the trap and make excuses for it. You know, it'd be kind of weird looking, some guy walking down the street and you hear this clang, clang, and shh, shh, you know, and you go, what in the world? And the guy walks by and he's got this jaw trap around his leg. And you go, you in a trap there? Oh, that, uh, well, you know, to me it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not a big issue. <laughs> be weird. Get your foot out of the trap. If you've been messing around with false symbols, or you got three-pointed stars in your home, or hexagrams, you know, six-pointed stars, or the this fish symbol, get rid of it. Don't keep it around and, oh, I think it's kind of neat and whatever. Get rid of it. Okay, you're not dealing with a Christian symbol. Christians shouldn't have symbols. They should have a book. A black book with gold gilt edge or other colors are acceptable. <laughs> you know, you should have a book. That should be our symbol. You want to tell how Christians are real or not? How do they know the book? That's the issue. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you so much for listening.